Right, brilliant. Okay, hello everybody. I'm going to get started because this is Jetlag Jamie and Jetlag Jamie is 1.20 a.m. in the morning. So I'm feeling a bit tired, but yeah, I'll try to do this justice. So you're probably all here because I put the Death Star in the title. There's no mention of Star Wars. I'm joking, there is. There's some Death Star in here, don't worry. Um, so a bit about myself. So my name is Jamie Coleman. Um, I am a developer advocate for Sonatype. Um, I used to work at IBM for a while. I worked on mainframes originally. Um, on Kicks, I worked on WebSphere application se server, um, worked on their JVM, did a bit of developer advocacy for them, and then decided I'd had enough of talking about microservices, so I went to do some security stuff. Yeah, not probably the best decision of my life, I'm joking, security is amazing. But um, who's heard of Sonatype? Hands up, anyone in here? A few of you, okay, cool. Um, I know this isn't a Java conference, but um, we're not just, you probably heard of Maven Central. This is something Sonatype has run for quite a while. Um, it's not the only thing we do, but if you're a Java developer, most likely you're downloading your dependencies from Maven Central. Um, some of the other products we have, stuff like Nexus Repository, things like that you might have heard of. Um, it was the first artifact repository in the world, pretty much. Um, there's lots of other alternatives nowadays. But yes, Sonatype, we do lots of stuff around software supply chain. So why this topic? Um, I want to talk about the similarities between the decisions the Empire made with the Death Star and what we do with software development, um, why we love open source code in general, some of the issues with the mass consumption we have today with open source code, a bit about what SCA is and how the Death Star and the Empire could have taken a bit of advantage of software composition analysis, um, why security matters in open source, some of the legislation which is going to force us to pay more attention to security in the future, um, a little bit about what SBOMs are, how you can make little, tr tr like do little tricks to improve your security posture with open source projects, um, and then some interesting stuff at the end. So open source and the Death Star, probably thinking what are the similarities between these things? Well, how was the Death Star constructed, right? So it was constructed, it was made up of many components. Um, these components came from all different parts of the galaxy. And each one of these planets or colonies, parts of the empire, um, they're spread everywhere, right? These components are then transported across the galaxy, um, in starships, whatever, um, to where they're all finally assembled. And then once the build is complete, um, it's tested. So we saw what the empire did with Alderaan. They tested their massive um, spaceship, essentially, to see if it worked, and it did. Um, by destroying a planet. Um, hopefully you're not doing that when you're doing your testing with <laughs> your applications, but that's what the Empire did. And essentially when the Emperor is happy, it's their move to production to destroy more planets, so like they tried to do with Endor. Um, so how are applications constructed? Well, you probably all know applications are made up of lots of different dependencies nowadays. It's very, very rare you'll find an application that doesn't use some kind of open source dependency. Um, to the point, I think it's something like 90% of modern applications is open source code. Um, different open source dependencies come from different people, organizations. Each of those dependencies are created across the planet. You have committers in every part of the globe, um, and that's generally a good sign of a healthy project. The dependencies are then transported across the internet to your dev environment, your machine, and then they're put together using something like Maven and Gradle, I know I'm being very Java specific here, um, to build your application uh, at a location of your choosing, which is usually locally on your laptop, and then you move it into your environments. Um, our applications are made up of lots of different dependencies, so once the build is complete, we then test our application to make sure it's functioning as expected, and then when our team lead or release manager is happy, it's deployed to production. So what are the similarities between what we do as engineers and developers and DevOps engineers to what happens with the Empire and the Death Star? So you can imagine your open source committers, they're like the planets and colonies under the Empire developing the different parts of the Death Star. Um, dependencies are kind of like components of the Death Star, I'd say. And application testing is firing the weapons, firing the Death Star, making sure you can destroy something, right? I mean, that was the point of the Death Star. Um, and I like to think of the evil emperor as being kind of like our team leads, right? Yeah, they're the ones that have the final say in everything. So, yeah, those are kind of the similarities. Sorry if anyone's a team lead here, I'm only joking. <laughs> um, but those are kind of the similarities between what we do with software development and the Death Star. So what's missing? Um, so have a think about that while I talk about why open source is great. I mean, you're 
this is technically an open source conference, so you probably all know that anyway, but just to reiterate. So why do we love modular Death Star? Why do we love open source dependencies? Well, open source has been around a while. I'm not going to go through the history. Here's a brief timeline of it. Um, I'm going to finish, try and finish a little bit earlier for you all because I'm also jet lagged and gonna want to go to sleep. But um, open source, technically the concept has been around a while. Now, it's only really gained traction later on with the introduction of things like GitHub and the internet and allow us to share it very, very quickly. But we, could ha we did have open source before that. There's many instances of open source being shared on physical media. We all know the benefits of open source, so obviously pers personal control, customizability, sometimes better privacy, better protection because you've got lots of people looking at it, um, low or no cost because it's free, um, and you've got lots of people with lots of different mindsets collaborating on these projects. So you get lots of different opinions, but it generally leads to better dependencies, to better software. And sharing is better, right? So like I mentioned, 90% of the applications we ship these days is open source dependencies. We didn't create that, we didn't, well we might have, we might have contributed to it, but generally we're borrowing other people's code. And that makes innovation a lot better, right? We can focus on the business logic when we're creating applications rather than having to focus on stuff people have already done, people have already created. So what are some of the issues with consuming open source like we do today? Well, you take an average Java project, for example, and an average Java project will have about 150 dependencies. Those dependencies have about 10 updates per year. So now, all of a sudden, we have 1,500 updates in one Java project to consider. And on top of that, not only when we pull in dependencies, we have to then pull in transistive dependencies. So this is, for example, Spring Boot. You, a lot of people, they'll pull in Spring Boot, and they think, okay, I'm only pulling in one dependency. No, you're pulling in loads of dependencies. And security is getting more and more of an issue with this stuff, right? So now the bad people, the bad actors are trying to attack every different part of the supply chain, the software supply chain, whether it's in our public repositories, our development environments. I mean, a lot of the tools we use, the open source tools, they're all built on open source code. So there is so many different attack vectors the bad people can take nowadays. Um, there's lots of different ways, and I'll go into detail a bit more about these later, that people can exploit dependencies and exploit our kind nature of sharing stuff. And now we're in a different era where we're now using microservices. So now not only do we have to have one bit worry about the dependencies in one big monolith, now we've got to worry about the dependencies in lots of microservices and keeping track of those dependencies, knowing what the health of them is. So similar problems essentially face the empire, and it faced the construction of the Death Star. So many of these components were built in remote locations, um, keeping track of how they were built and the quality was difficult for the Empire, as we saw. Um, the Death Star is massive. It's very, very a big, complex piece of engineering. And vulnerability testing is generally an afterthought with a lot of people, uh, with a lot of developers. Um, and the Empire was being confident that they had no vulnerabilities. They were confident that they built the best weapon in the galaxy, right? So when the rebels started to attack, um, and when the Empire realized they had a vulnerability, because they realized quite late, um, they, they couldn't really do much. And it's kind of similar to, you know, nowadays we don't have much time to react to security vulnerabilities. Um, we, it's down to usually a few days now. Um, and same with the Empire, at this point it was way too late. So yes, lots of similarities between what we do and what they did with the, em the Empire did with the Death Star, et cetera. But why does this matter to us? Well, cybercrime is not going away. If anything, it's getting bigger. So if I we look at statistics from 2016, cybercrime was making 450 billion US dollars a year. Um, usually I have to translate this to local currencies, but now I'm in the US, I don't have to, which was nice. Um, so that's 14,000 US dollars a second, and that's equivalent to 50 of these humongous aircraft carriers, right? Bear in mind, Britain has two aircraft carriers, and cybercrime in 2016, in one year, was making enough to build 50 of these. Do you think that's got worse in 2022? Of course it's got worse. To the point, it's now 6 trillion US dollars a year, right? That's 200,000 US dollars a second. 
I did try and put a counter in at the start of this presentation, but my macro messed up. What I wanted to show you is how much money cybercrime had earned since I started this presentation. I think it's something by now, how many minutes am I on, 21? I think it's probably something now by, I don't know, $200 million since I started talking today, right? And that's equivalent to 620 of these aircraft carriers. So I kind of tried to convig it, con convert it into galactic currency. So again, lots of, lots, yeah, lots and lots of spaceships you could buy with this, right? But if cybercrime had the GDP of a country, it would be the third largest country in terms of GDP in the world. Like, is that like mind blowing, right? And then going back to the problem the empire had, they had very little time to react to the vulnerability that was found in the Death Star. And that is the same as software developers. That is the same as all of us as engineers. We're down to a day now, roughly, before a big vulnerability comes out and it gets exploited. I mean, look at Log4J, right? I mean, it didn't take long from when that was announced for people to be hacked all over the world. And open source is in everything, right? It's in healthcare devices, it's in aircrafts, it's in self-driving cars, it's in trains. I mean, we are relying on this bounty of free open source code everywhere. Now, there is things that are changing. So before, imagine if you bought a car, imagine you bought a BMW and the BMW had a fault. Um, I actually had, a, it was a Mercedes actually, but it had a fault that if you went round the roundabout slightly too quickly, the airbag would go off. Like what? What? <laughs> and of course, by law, they have to recall those, right? I know you know these guys don't have many roundabouts here, so it's like a circle thing, cars go around, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> it definitely wasn't a feature. Every time I went round and round, it took them years to recall it. Every time I went round, I was like, oh God, please don't go. But there's legislation protecting us from stuff like that, right? There's legislation protecting us from manufacturing faults but there isn't that much legislation protecting us from software vulnerabilities. Um, and that is changing. So I, you're probably all aware, um, so yeah, moving on a bit, the US uh, National Cybersecurity Strategy. This is changing, so if you're dealing with the government, if you're selling software to the government, you have to provide them with things like SBOMs, so Software Bill of Materials. Now, the EU has gone a bit further, um, a bit too far in my opinion, they're basically making anyone who works for a company that commits to open source liable for that open source project. In my opinion, I think that's way, way too far. Um, hashtag Brexit, yeah, we don't have to deal with that. <laughs> but that, I think that, in my opinion, that will stifle innovation, it will stifle people committing to open source projects because, for example, Red Hat commits to lots of open source projects. Why would they send their engineers to commit to open source projects they don't even use and then they're liable for it? So again, more legislation. Again, they have a requirement for SBOMs, things like that. Um, the UK is trying to put legislation in as well around this, not as bad as the EU legislation, but again, trying to require things like SBOMs, making companies more responsible for the applications they ship and the code they ship. So what is software composition analysis, SCA? Well, this is something I think that we all should all be doing. Um, and I like to think of it a bit like this. So I look at this cake, for example, and I can see there's some sponge in there, some icing, and some fruit on top, right? But what really good software composition analysis to is dive much deeper than that. I don't want to know this sponge. That's like looking at my Maven POM file, right? I can see what dependencies I've got there. But I want to know what those dependencies are made out of. I want to know if they're, for example, the sponge, what flour it is, if it's using eggs, etc. So essentially basic SEA tools will provide you a list of dependencies that you're using and some basic information like what is the latest. Um, but a really good tool will give you information about transistive dependencies, um, any vulnerabilities they contain, um, project scoring, so scoring each open source project to check the health of it, um, things like that, visualizations of uh, how bad your dependencies are, um, licensing data because as we know many companies are changing their open source licenses all the time and you don't want to pull down an update for a vulnerable piece of open source um, software and all of a sudden your license has changed, you put that in production and now you're legally liable or you have to open source all of your code. So all these things are quite important. And if the Empire had used some SCA tools with the Death Star, I think they might have been able to beat the Rebels. 
Um, for example, they could have got a list of the declared components in the Death Star, some basic information, but I, yeah, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. I call the Empire's S-bombs C-bombs, because component bombs, but, you know, whatever. Um, so, S-bombs, if you don't know what they are, software bill of materials, um, they're great, but if you don't do anything with them, they're pretty much useless. Um, yes, they can help you abide by the laws, etc., but you want to actually be doing something with your S-bombs, right? Um, there's lots of easy ways to generate S-bombs. Cyclone DX has a Maven plugin. There's Kubernetes that will create a Kubernetes bomb, things like that. So there's, lot, there's no excuses to start creating them. Um, but it's what you do with them. So actually using tools that scan your S-bombs, take the information out and look at the vulnerability data, look at pr how well the project's is health is. And you know, moving to the latest version of a dependency is not always a good thing. Um, it just means it hasn't been tested enough to find out if it's got vulnerabilities in. Um, so stuff we do at Sonatype is to try and figure out not moving people to the latest, but moving them to a version that we know will be healthy for as long as possible and probably will have the least amount of vulnerabilities. Now that takes a lot of data and a lot of analytics to do, but always moving to the latest isn't the best thing. Like I mentioned, security posture is very important for open source projects. Um, not many years ago, a lot of these entities didn't exist. Um, now, well, obviously Cloud Native Compute Foundation did, but a lot of these other entities didn't exist. Um, and that's because now they're trying to standardize the way we think of security and the way we do things. And again, it's not that hard to make very simple improvements to your open source projects, your applications. So we looked at lots of different metrics to try and score the health of an open source project. And some of the worst ones are things like, let's have a look, like branch protection. Like who's not using branch protection these days? Like things like that. And you'll be surprised about the amount of open source projects that don't have some of these basic protections in place. And they're quite easy things to implement. And these open source scanning tools that are scanning your projects to give them ratings, these things make a big difference to those project scores. Um, so yeah, easy ways to improve that don't really require that much effort. Code reviews, if you're not doing code reviews, you definitely should be starting to think about doing them. Um, binaries outside your projects is never a good thing. Dependencies pinned to a specific version is never a good thing. Um, and secure branches. So again, really easy security things you can do to improve the health of your projects. Um, but yeah, the software supply chain, it's, 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 you know, we get our stuff from the internet, we consume it all the time. Um, but again, there's just lots of different ways we can, we can make changes to do that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it doesn't take a lot to make a small mistake in your code to, to add a vulnerability. Um, so for example, the difference here between uh, the larger than and larger than equals to is a vulnerability that has a CVE attached to it. Not a major CVE, but it doesn't take a lot for you to make small changes in your code to accidentally create vulnerabilities. So we need to be paying more attention to the health of the dependencies we add into our projects. So secret weapon, Maven Central. I don't know, yes, this is very much Java focus, but Maven Central, we made some decisions quite early on which a lot of the other ecosystems didn't. So for example, um, you having to own the domain name when you're submitting or pushing up um, open source projects or open source dependencies to Maven Central. And that stopped a lot of bad people getting stuff into Maven Central. I mean, you look at you know, the Python repositories and the Node repositories, they are full of malware, full of it. And now they're trying to implement stuff that we did with Maven Central. I mean, there was, I think it was a few years ago where all the repositories got hacked. And they called up um, Joel, who runs Maven Central, and he was like, no, we're fine. What, what's wrong with you guys? <laughs> I mean, th when we implemented this, own, you have to own the domain, like everyone hated it. It was such a pain. And for us managing it, it's a pain as well. Like if that domain change ownership, it's quite annoying for us because we, we don't have automated processes. I mean, Maven Central, we run for free. We don't make any money off it. It runs on AWS. You can imagine our cloud bill. Um, I think we've recently served up two trillion um, components via Maven Central. So yeah, it costs us a lot of money. Um, but people, there are now malware generators. Now with Maven Central, we scan everything. Now we do not let malware into Maven Central. I think the only time malware got in is when we put it in as a test to see if we could get it in. Um, but it generally has never gone in. Now vulnerabilities are different. They're mistakes in the code that cause security vulnerabilities. And we have a stance there where we do not remove them because we can break a lot of people's builds to the point that 
um, Logford J, to date, to date, I think in the last seven days, 33% of all Log4j downloads are still the most vulnerable Java vulnerability in history. In the last seven days, 33% of all Log4j downloads are still that vulnerable version. Um, and so imagine if we took that down, we're going to break 33% of everyone's builds that are using Log4j. Um, but yeah, so there's lots of different ways people can attack us. Um, Maven Central helps with a few of these things. For example, typo squatting, um, you can't do that. Um, dependency confusion, not really a Java problem. Um, open source repo attacks are a bit harder. So technically, someone could get the credentials from someone who owns a domain, like the org.apache domain or something. If someone got those credentials, they could put bad stuff in Maven Central. Luckily, that hasn't happened yet. Um, but yeah, there are ways. But generally, in Java, people are quite protected. But the actual next secret weapon is all of you, right? We're the ones that can help protect us, our businesses, our applications, our clients. Um, like I mentioned, I think this was 2021, right? So this wasn't that long after Log4j came out. And again, we have all this data because we have Maven Central. So we can look at who's downloading what and where it's going to what countries around the world and things like that. Um, so back then, it was 33%. So 51 million um, downloaded in probably about six months. So this is slightly out of date. Um, I know I checked this morning. That is actually that 21% is still 31%, and I think now we're at something like 350 million downloads of the biggest Java vulnerability in the world. So it's we need to be careful and we need to take ownership of these things ourselves as engineers because if we're not, who else is going to do it, right? Um, and a lot of the time. It's, these things are avoidable. I mean, we look at our clients and our customers, and we can see what versions of things they're on, and we know that our less vulnerable versions they can update to uh, most of the time without breaking changes. Now, a lot of people don't do it because it's a lot of effort. It requires a lot of time, um, and some people just don't have the right tools to do it. Um, so essentially, take when you start a new project, when you start um, thinking about what dependencies, what frameworks you're going to use, don't just look at what's popular, look at what's healthy, right? Because we notice that and with our customers, a lot of people are on specific frameworks, but that's not because they're healthy, that's because they can't get off them <laughs> because that functionality doesn't exist anywhere else. So when you create a new project or a new application, um, pay attention to the health of the projects you're using. I mean, you can, also all, or you can all contribute to those projects to make them more healthy, um, but yeah, lots of ways, lots of different ways. You know, you can think about this. Um, so yeah, project scoring is one. Uh, it's something we try to do on Maven Central, so to give projects um, a score. Now, I think we took this down because I got a bit annoyed at um, Sonatype about this because they were giving scoring without giving remediation advice and reasoning. And I was like, no, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> if you're going to give people advice and scoring on the projects, and it was correct information, but it's like you need to give the people who own those projects like advice and help of how to you know, fix those problems. Um, so they've kind of gone back to the drawing board to think about that. But there's lots of ways we can do things to kind of do that. So again, back to like the Empire. Um, to be honest, I think if the Empire would have won against the Rebels, if only they had paid attention to their supply chain, you know, use some software composition analysis tools maybe. Um, without the exhaust ven um, vulnerability, the Death Star would have been pretty much impenetrable. Probably not. Um, I'm sure there would be another vulnerability there. And um, in Java, that would essentially been their log for J. So that's what the Rebels took advantage of. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. So with that, I'm going to say long live the empire, bring peace and prosperity to the galaxy, and then long live Ceph4 engineers as well. Um, just to finish, there's some useful links here. And the top one is a, a history of supply chain attacks for the last like 20 odd years. Um, the state of the software supply chain report is something Sonodyte produces every year, which talks about the state of open source, popular open source projects, um, popular frameworks, popular languages. Um, the log4j data you can find there as well. And if you want to find some more information about the um, legislation that's been implemented in the US, um, the bottom link will take you there. Um, get in touch. We're on social media and lots of different places. Um, some more cool stuff to check out. We've changed Maven Central. Um, we have a developer site. Um, and if you want to know more about software composition analysis, me and a few colleagues have created a series on Fuji, which is like Friends of Java um, website. Um, talking about what software composition analysis is and how you can take advantage of it. 
And with that, if you want to find the slides to my talk or any of my talks, just scan the QR code. Um, the link that it goes to is the slides and recordings one there. It's just a GitHub page. I am not a front-end developer. Do not hate on me for the basic websites you will probably enter. Um, my wife is, she's actually in security now, but she is actually a front-end developer, and I sent her a link, and she was like, what have you done? What is this? I was like, well, you can submit pull requests, right? You know, open source in that community. So she has actually agreed to fix my website. But it is basic, right? But yeah, I'm a back-end developer in trade, so yeah, don't judge. Um, but yeah, with that, um, I'm going to end. Um, thank you very much for your time. I know it's the last session of the day. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. I'm going to have some food, pass out. I don't know why they put me as the last session of the day, knowing I've come all the way from London, but nah, it's all good. I'm actually flying home to London and then going straight to Singapore, so I don't know what jet lag I'm ha I have these days. I'm just kind of going with the flow. Um, but yeah, with that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the conference. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm going to take a picture of you all, if you don't mind, just so I can prove that I did actually come to LA to do some work. It's actually my first time in LA, so it's been good fun. Um, any questions? Yes, lots of questions. Uh, is there a microphone, or do they just shout? You've got to shout. So you first, because I can. <laughs> I can indeed. There we go. Next question. Yes. <laughs> nice, I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, okay, yep. <laughs> right, so similarities would be, for example, um, you've got a disgruntled employee. You've got a disgruntled person who works on an open source project, right? I mean, people are taking advantage of this attack vector. I mean, you get people that will disguise themselves as an open source committer for six months with the intent of either taking control of that project or sneaking in vulnerabilities that people just won't realize because they think they're a valid committer. So, yeah, it's kind of a similar situation to what can happen with open source projects where we can get disgruntled people or people that were there specifically to put a vulnerability in. So like we saw with the Death Star, that vulnerability was kind of put in on purpose, right? He had planned to do that before they had taken him away and made him do it. Kind of like what we have to do with developers, right? Sometimes, nah, they don't. They, sometimes they take us away and put us in a dark room and we get disgruntled. So he had already made the decision that before they were going to take him away and force him to work there, he was going to put that vulnerability in. So similar situations to like what we do, yeah. Yes, next question. Where'd that number come from? Good question. I stole those slides off a colleague, so <laughs> message me on social media and I will go and find out where it came from. Um, I actually thought about that today because I thought I don't actually have a direct link to that information. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, and I presume it's going to be a lot higher nowadays. Um, I generally used to have a slide with Pablo Escobar in because um, like cyber criminals, they don't ever get caught, whereas uh, the drug trade does. So, like, if Pablo Escobar was alive today, he'd probably just have a room full of coders. <laughs> he'd make a lot more money and he'd probably still be alive, right? So, yeah. Cool. Next question. Yes. Yes. Cool. Go for it. Well... I don't have anything against them specifically, but you've got to test your application somewhere, right? You know, and at the time they were pissing off the empire, so you know it was justified. Yeah. Yes, and the serious question. <laughs> okay, you want to get into DevSecOps, but you don't know where to start. So we do have a resource center. Um, it's not going to get you into the nitty gritty parts of it, but it will give you a good overview of what to look at and where to start and what to start thinking about. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. Um, if you wanted to start, I mean, there's lots of resources out there, lots of different um, vendors produce their own stuff. Um, 
we do have a dev zone. Uh, so if you go to Sonatype, there's a dev zone up there, and it'll give you a lot of introductory articles about what to start thinking about, what tools to start thinking about, um, planning kind of how. So there's a lot of stuff around. Um, Developers are very resistant to new processes, and rightly so, when they're being asked to do so much. Um, so there's an article series which I'm currently in the middle of writing of how security professionals can collaborate and get developers on board in regards to thinking about this stuff. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. No worries, yes. Uh, as a as a, as opposed to microservices. Um, so I don't know what the question is. Say again. Oh right, yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Um, for security or dependencies and stuff like that and open source usage, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm biased. I've come from a microservice background. Um, I've always advocated for microservices. Um, it just depends on what you're doing. A lot of people jumped on the Microsoft bandwagon um, quite early on when they really didn't have a need for it. Um, when I worked at IBM, we had a few customers that wanted to rewrite some of their applications. And for example, in WebSphere, there was a customer that had been running a server without turning it off in 15 years with a monolith application that they wanted to rewrite in, in um, microservices. And we just kind of went, no, don't, don't turn this off. Like, we can't guarantee it'll come back up again. And it's been running for 15 years. Um, and it was only performing basic functions. It wasn't costing them a lot to run. So in those regards, unless they really need to rewrite all the business logic, I would suggest just to stay with what it is. But it just depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? So I think if you're going for huge scales and you're running on the clouds, um, then microservices start to make a lot more sense. So. Um, is it easier to update them? I'd say yes, because microservices are generally easier to update. Um, you can do lots of things, so you don't interrupt traffic and things like that. Um, but it, the problem comes in managing and monitoring all these different services, as opposed to just having to monitor one application. But if you've got the right tools in place, so Sonatype have a tool called Lifecycle, which can plug into your dev environment, into each one of your services, and continuously monitors it from when you're developing, when you're testing, and when it's in production. So having the right tools in place can help with that. Um, so yeah, it's basically it all comes down to having the right tools to do these things, because they do exist out there. Um, it's just a case of buying them and using them, essentially. Yes? Yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, yeah, um, don't do that, anyone. Um, <laughs> um, I remember when I first started working at IBM and I uploaded some token, I was like, shit, and they, <laughs> and they were like, uh, it caused them a lot of effort to get that back out of GitHub, but yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, just to follow on, um, always externalize and put them somewhere else. Don't put any secrets, credentials, whatever, in any of your applications, so yeah, thank you. Yes? Yes. Yes, definitely. Hundred percent, and these are global organisations. Like they have a chapter in Berlin, they have a chapter in London, they have chapters everywhere. And these are, like, these people know their shit, right? These are security professionals. Otherwise, they wouldn't be part of these things. So, 
and again, these are kind of, uh, they're not brand new, but you know, they didn't exist like 10 years ago. And now people have just kind of got to the point where it's like, we need some standards for this stuff. Everyone's doing their own thing. And that's where OWASP and some of these other foundations have come in. So yeah, do hook with your local OWASP chapter. They are in pretty much every major city. Um, there's a few colleagues of mine that have actually started them up in like tiny small cities in Germany. And they are now getting, you know, like 100, 150 attendees for every meetup. So yeah, do engage with them to learn more about this stuff. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they, I mean, they, they do this. Uh, they, a lot of these people that are working for other companies that are part of these foundations are doing this because they want to improve global security. They want everyone to be more secure. So they're very, very willing to have conversations and give you advice and show you where to go if you need resources. So yeah, thank you for that. Any other questions before I go to sleep? We're all good? All right, thank you, everybody. Hope you had a good day.